Hey guys, today I'm going to talk about HIV disclosure laws in Singapore. Why am I suddenly talking about such an unusual topic? Well, because this week there was an appeal to the High Court on this very issue, HIV disclosure and the requirements. The judge of the High Court laid down new sentencing guidelines for persons, uh, positive persons, uh, I shall call them POS now, POS people, P-O-Z, who do not disclose their status before engaging in, uh, before they make stuff, okay. Before I go on, I shall talk about the Infectious Disease Act. Section 23 of the Infectious Disease Act states that a person who knows that he has HIV shall not make stuff with another person unless he has informed the person of the risk of contracting HIV from him and the person has voluntarily agreed to accept that risk. Now, in my personal opinion, I think that is a very uh, onerous requirement because you are, the, the legislation is, is essentially uh, destroying the, the love lives of uh, POS people. The court in Public Prosecutor and GCP, which is the case, of the High Court case I was talking about, the judge in that case also highlighted this point that it is not enough, okay, to inform the prospective partners that a person, a past person, has HIV. He has also to convey to inform the other person that. Um, that, that there is a risk of transmission because according to the judge, some victims may be ignorant, poorly informed or misinformed. I'm afraid I have to respectfully disagree with the judge as well as the legislation section 23 of the Infectious Disease Act. I am of the view that the act should be amended to provide for exceptions because in this day and age, 2019, there have been progresses in uh, HIV treatment such that uh, POS people uh, who are on treatment are not able to transmit the virus. Okay. Number one, I believe there should be an exception for POS people who use condoms because the uh, failure rate of condoms is uh, negligible. Even if for the sake of argument, the condom breaks, there's this thing called post-exposure prophylaxis. Essentially, you go to the emergency department of the hospital, you take some medication for a month and no HIV infection. Number two, there's this global uh, campaign called U equals U, undetectable equals untransmittable. Essentially, now the HIV medications are so effective that they can reduce HIV in the blood to undetectable levels. That means the machines cannot even detect the HIV. And it, has, and it has been shown in numerous studies like the Lancet, JAMA, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, that uh, a person with HIV who is undetectable cannot transmit the virus even if he does not use condoms. So, and this has been uh, endorsed by the US CDC as well. Also, I believe that certain sexual acts, the, the risk of transmission is so remote that they should be made exceptions. For example, uh, there was uh, a person who ice cream a boy in a toilet. In other words, uh, the boy was a recipient so there, there is virtually zero risk of transmission for a person performing fellatio on the other person. Nonetheless, he was uh, jailed for a year. It seems that the court is aware of this concept of uh, undetectable and the accused claim in court that he was un undetectable and that he had informed his partner uh, that he was undetectable but the court, the judge stated that even if he was undetectable, he would not have discharged the obligation under the Infectious Disease Act, Section 23, if the victim did not appreciate the risk 
or was lulled into a false belief that, was, that there was little or no risk of contracting HIV infection from the accused. I'm extremely puzzled by this, by this statement from the judge with respect to the judge. It has already been uh, shown in very reputable international journals that there is zero risk of transmission. So I'm unable to understand the, the, the statement, false belief that there was little or no risk of contracting HIV. In addition, the court also set a new sentencing framework. Number one, where there is a low risk of transmission and low culpability, the sentence for not disclosing HIV status would range from a fine or a sentence of up to two years. Okay. Uh, in my opinion, I believe that this would be applicable to undetectable persons who use condoms. Number two, if uh, higher risks are involved and there's greater culpability, uh, for example, not using condoms, even though one is undetectable, the sentence could range between two and six years. Number three, where actual harm occurs, that means the victim contracts HIV because of the person not disclosing and not using uh, condoms or whatever, the, the punishment would be 6 to 10 years. What are the aggravating uh, factors that would uh, influence a court in deciding on the appropriate uh, punishment or jail time for persons who do not disclose the HIV status? This would include an intention to transmit HIV. You intend to, tra to, to, to spread the virus. Number two, deception or misrepresentation by the accused of his HIV status. So for example, you know you are pause, but you tell the other person you are negative. So that will be an, another aggravating factor. Uh, a third aggravating factor will be multiple instances of sexual activity over a period of, a t of time, as opposed to a one-off instance. So if, if you uh, make stuff, with this person 10 times, okay, without condoms, it will be a, an aggravating factor as opposed to doing it one time with him. A fourth aggravating factor would be having multiple partners. Number five, frequency of sexual activity, as uh, this is an indication of recklessness of the accused in repeatedly uh, putting his partners at risk of contracting HIV. A sixth aggravating factor, unprotected sexual activity. So if you are paused and you so if you are paused, you might want to consider using condoms if you don't want to disclose for whatever reasons. Because, so because unprotected sexual activity is an uh, is an aggravating factor. The last aggravating factor, age of vulnerability age or vulnerability of the victim. For example, young victims, uh, you're more likely to get a longer prison sentence if the victim is a young person, adolescent. Next, I'm going to talk about Section 23.2 of the Infectious Disease Act, which, uh, which concerns a person who does not know that he has an HIV infection but has reason to believe he has, okay? He has reason to believe he has. He, before he makes stuff with the other person, he has to inform the other person of the risk of uh, contracting HIV and the person has to uh, accept the risk. But what is the meaning of has reason to believe that he may have HIV? Is it because he has a cough, he has a flu, he has a cold, he has diarrhea? What could be reasons to believe? So I find it a bit, a very odd provision. There's no definition of reason to believe. Number two, not only does he have to inform the other person of the risk of contracting HIV, he has to undergo an HIV test at the time of the sexual activity. I find this ludicrous. I mean, um, before you mix stuff with your partner, are you supposed to do a HIV test? Where are you going to find an HIV test to do it in front of him? 
um, this does not take into account uh, what happens in the real world. So number three, the third condition, during the, uh, when he makes things, he has to take reasonable precautions to ensure he does not expose the other person to HIV infection. So thanks for watching this video on disclosure of HIV.